there's a lot of lessons we can learn right here. And one great lesson you'll find is the lesson about our Savior. The lesson about our Savior. There is no Savior like ours. None like ours. There's a, an old song that I used to hear and I used to sing and, and it always blesses me. Once I was straying in sin's dark valley, no hope within could, could I see. They searched through heaven and they found. The Savior, and He saved a poor lost soul like me. Oh, I'll say. same nail scarred hand will lead me safely Like the Lord, they can't anybody give me peace like the Lord. They can nobody save my soul but the Lord. His blood is the blood that washes away all sin. No matter what it might be, though my sins be as a sin and stain of scarlet, He will wash them and make them whiter, whiter, whiter than snow. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, what a Savior. And that's what I want to capitalize upon this morning. Three aspects about our Savior. Three aspects of the supernatural power of our Lord. Number one, He gave His peace. He gave peace when He said in verse 8, Fear them not. Do not fear. How many of us walk around sometimes in fear? And i got to raise my hands in two of them sometimes. There's fear. And it's a conquering, it's a, it, it seems like a conquering force coming against us. Fear. Fear hath torment. 
But he said, fear them not. Though there's five great nations coming against you, fear them not. Act as though they are one. Act as though they are the weakest of all when they come against you. You know something? He's still on the throne. Our God is still there. He still speaks those same words that He spoke to Joshua. He's speaking to us today. And every day, remind yourself. Remind yourself when He says, Fear not. Fear not. No matter what a doctor's report might come against you and say, that this is what you have got. You can walk from that office without fear. You can walk without, off, out without fear because He says, I've already delivered them into your hands. There was a lady in High Point, North Carolina in one of the revival meetings. And she had a, 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 a growth, a, a, a lump in her breast. And she suspected and she feared this is cancer. But just as soon as God, uh, as that was revealed to her in the physical, the Lord spoke a word and said, You need not fear. I am your healer. And I will deliver you. And she went to the doctor the next day because that was her appointment. And the doctor, after the examinations, came back to her and said, I'm sorry to say that the biopsy has revealed that you've got cancer of the breast. She made no response. She acted like he'd never even said anything. And he said, do you understand what I'm telling you? Thinking that maybe she's in shock. And she said, Doc, I don't have to worry about it. He said, it's cancer. We've got to do something about it. She said, I don't have to worry about it because God has already talked to me. And he's told me that he is going to heal me. And she left that office. She didn't worry about it. She continued to go on about her way. She went back for a follow-up visit to see how large it's grown. And to the doctor's amazement, he could not find the lump. And there was no trace in her blood of any cancer cells whatsoever. And the doctor had to admit, I've witnessed a miracle. This is the power that God gives to us when He speaks to you and says, You don't need to fear. I am the Lord. And I change not. He says, I'm the one that gives you peace. The peace that passes all of your understanding according to Philippians 4 verse 7. I am the God who has never changed. His word never changes. And that same peace is still just as indescribable as it was when he gave it the first time. There was a man one day who was walking down the beach of San Diego. It was winter time. And he was so distraught because he had been the manager over two radio stations in greater Los Angeles area. He lived in a house with his wife and four children in a Beverly Hills mansion. New cars and servants. Money to buy anything he wanted to buy. But something happened in his life that caused him to have a downward sparrow in, uh, in his, in his uh, thinking, in his mind, his nerves. He had a nervous breakdown. Couldn't handle it. He lost his wife, his four children. And he headed towards nothing but total despair. He said, I remember distinctly this winter morning that I was headed to a hotel. Drabbed hotel because my wife and children, I had drugged them down to where they had a, a, just a very meager little, little nothing to live in. We'd lost everything. And now I'm headed to this hotel, probably to end it all. He said, and I flopped into the chair of the room. And as my eyes began to gaze across the room, I saw on the table a Bible. The Gideons had put that Bible there. He said, I, I picked it up. He said, I started reading. Nonchalantly just reading. But all of a sudden... Words were familiar that I read that came back from my childhood. He said, all of a sudden, as I began to read more and more, I saw where God is the help 
in the time of need. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. He said, I've turned around, I've laid the Bible open in the chair, and I made an altar there. And I had determined and I had bowed, God, I will not leave this room until I know that my sins are covered by your blood. And he prayed, and he prayed. He says, if I have to stay here and fast until I'm starved, he said, I'm staying here until I know beyond a shadow of a doubt it's all taken care of. And he prayed. And all of a sudden he said there was a joy that began to sweep into that room and over his soul and his mind. He began to rise up with a newness of life. He felt good. He felt fresh. He couldn't understand it. You see, he had lost his voice and been, because of the nerves, and he couldn't speak for over a year and a half. So consequently, radio was nothing for him to be venturing into. But God not only healed him, but restored his voice that very day. He went back to his wife, his children, asked forgiveness. They were reconciled. God healed that battle. And then, furthermore, God even opened up a door to where he was the chief manager of a program called the Haven of Rest in that city of Los Angeles. And God had restored everything that had been in a battle prior to. God brought peace in the midst of a situation that could have been so desperate that he would have lost his life or taken his life. Here, in the, here lately you see people that are taking their life. One football player last night uh, reported taking his life because of a lack of peace within the heart. Folks, if we would just stop, just stop and make an altar and bow before God and let the peace of God come upon us. We would find restoration. We would find that He is a God of His Word and we will be restored. The secret to walking in peace is to walk by faith. John 14, verse 27. When the day of battle comes, you can rest in the fact that, Hey, Lord, I'm trusting in You. I like what Psalm, uh, Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6 says. If we trust in the Lord and do good. Delight ourselves in the Lord and commit our way unto God. He will bring it to pass. But how many of us, when we commit something to God, we do it in prayer. Oh, yes, Lord, I thank you for taking this thing. And I thank you for working it out. Amen. And then we take it back and we carry it under our arms as if God can't do anything unless you let it go. And it's hard to let go sometimes because we are natured to fix things. We are natured to, to, to make it right. Sometimes we just can't do it. He gave peace. And also in that same verse 8, He gave a promise. He gave a promise. Joshua, fear not. Because I have given the enemy over into your hands. Do not fear as you stand before them. God's promises. Wow. There was a guy that bought a blue blazer at Nordstrom. Now, this store has a return policy, second to none. We'll promise you that if you're not satisfied, we will refund your money or replace the item. He bought this blazer, and he wore it for six months. He found in the six months it wasn't quite the color he wanted. Well, okay. And he said it caught lint like no other coat he had ever had. He had to clean it all the time. He said, but I wore it for six months, and finally I got tired of cleaning it, so I put it into the closet. Sat there in the closet for over a year. Finally, he said I was going through my closet and saw it, and he remembered I remember a promise that Nordstrom made about the return policy. I wonder. So he said, well, I've got nothing to lose. So he took the coat and off he goes to that store. Walking in with great confidence until he sees a guy behind the counter with a big old mustache, ready to take your money kind of person. 
And he goes up and he, he says, uh, and he tells him the story. He said, I'm telling you what, I've had this coat for a year and a half. It catches lint like no other coat I've ever had in my life. And it's not quite the right color either. Uh, now, what about your return policy? And the guy says, you had it for a year and a half. He said, yeah. He says, for heaven's sakes, man, why did you wait so long? Come on back here with me. Took the coat, put it over to the side, and said, now you pick out what you want. He said, I picked out a coat that was $75 more than what the first coat cost. And the guy says, now I hope you're happy. You just go right on. The promise has been fulfilled. Wow. God's promise is better than Nordstrom's. Any time, he says, come on, come unto me. I'll take care of you. That's the promises of God. That's what we can depend upon. Look in Romans 8, verse 35. Romans 8. I, I love Romans 8. And I, I would hope that you're taking my advice and studying it, reading it, and memorizing it. But the, verse 35, uh, 35 uh, says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation... Distress, persecution, famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. It's written, for the sake we are killed all the day long, we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. Wow, what a promise. We are more than conquerors through Him. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 57, And thanks be unto God that gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm walking in victory. Walking in victory even now because of His promise. His promises are yea and amen. You can depend upon them. And don't read a promise that is so greatly outlandish that you look at it and say, Oh, man, I, can, I know other people that are walking like Billy Graham and done all the things like Apostle Paul. I can see that these people can receive these things, but not me. I don't do anything but just attend church and, and do what I think is right. And uh, Who am I? Yeah, who are you? You are the very one that Christ died for. You're the very one who, if you were the only one, He would have come and done it all for you. That's how much He loves you. His promises, His peace are ours. And also, one other thing we can see from this is His power. He's given us peace. He's given us the promise. And He's given us power. Verse 9 through 14. You, you, we were read that. And what was that power there? First off, in verse 11, it was hailstones. Can you just see Joshua? Jo Lord, they're outrunning us. The enemy is retreating, but we want to kill them. We want to wipe them out. We want to totally destroy them as according to your will. And we can't catch up with them. The Lord says, oh, don't worry about it. Boom, boom. And he rains down hailstones upon them and kills them. Wow. That's the power of God. That's what God does to your enemies. When sometimes you seemingly can't do anything and you've, you've, you've used your voice to where you cried and you can't cry anymore and you wonder God what can I do and God says don't worry I see the enemy and I'll destroy it I'll take care of it I'll take care of the situation that's what our God does that's the power of God and then when there are seasons when the Lord says I know you want to take this victory I've given you the victory I've given them all in your hands but I know you'd like to see something done to your enemy so I'm going to tell you what you go and give them this time and the Lord gives you an opportunity to fight a good fight of faith. Joshua says, yeah, but we can't see in the dark. Well, what do you, what do you suggest, Joshua? Lord, just let the sun stand still. And it was. Man, can't you, don't you know those five kings and all their armors were waiting for dark fall? Oh, man, we're... Where's the darkness? Where can we hide? And there was no place to hide because the light gave them away. Aren't you glad that God is the light and always takes care of the enemy for us? He never, ever sits upon you. He never, ever lets His light die down. It never dims. It's always as bright as it's always ever been. And so the sun stood still. Now, a lot of people have taken that and said, well, now wait just a minute. That just proves the Bible doesn't know what it's talking about. 
Well, let's look at that just for a second. I, I, I used to have uh, some uh, some of the scientific stuff on this thing, but but just just know this. It's the language because we know that the sun does not rotate around the earth, but vice versa. And yet he said, sun stand still. Well, how many of you have ever heard the phrase, and as the sun sets slowly into the west? Well, the sun didn't set and the sun doesn't rise. But we say it, sunrise. So it's the language. It was the language that's understood. We know, but how would you, how would you say it? And as the, as the earth rotates and the sun disappears in the west, <laughs> it's just a lot easier to say sunrise and sunset, huh? This was the language, and it was a language understood. But you know, ancient history supports the claim that this was a day that stood still. Chinese, Babylon, the Artes, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, Aztecs, the uh, Egyptians, the Assyrians, and other ancient cultures prove and show there was a day that was lengthened. The calendar supports it. Our calendar supports it. Some say, hey, preacher, uh, I want to remind you that there is no law of nature here that, that supports that. I'm going to remind you, there is no such thing as a law of nature. There's always a law of God, and He can do what He wants to do. Amen. The bottom line is this. God intervenes supernaturally on the behalf of Israel. And that same God is the God to do the same thing for you. What does it mean to us? Well, it means this. that I've, I've seen supernatural things happen in the lives of people. I've seen drunks sobered and completely delivered all in an instance. I've seen people that were sick and dying healed in an instant. And five minutes later, breathing and talking as if they had not undergone anything. I have seen drug addicts that had come to church and totally healed, sobered, and delivered from the drug addictions. Even one, one revival, I, I, was, I, I was gathering up all the drugs that had been put on the platform and I, I put it in a bag. Rather than flush it, I forgot and put it in my car <laughs> and drove home, <laughs> thinking when I got home, thank you, God, that it wasn't a cop that pulled me over. I've had some explaining to do. Whoa, Lord, done it again. I'd be a lot of reasons, sure. But on the other hand, I've seen drunks saved. And they were set free, but they had to undergo a battle. Same with drug addictions. Same with healing. I've seen the process, but it was a process on the upward scale. So however God chooses to move in our midst, you just need to know that God is still on the throne. He has not retreated. He's still watchful. He never slumbers. He doesn't sleep. His eye is constantly watching you, not to find, ah, you've done something wrong, I'm going to get you now. His eye is always watching you to say, I see an enemy approaching. Sometimes you're warned and sometimes you're not. But no matter what, he's always there in your defense. This is the God we serve. This is, oh, what a Savior. This is who we love, who loves us far greater than we can ever understand his love. And how could we refuse such a such a person as this. How could we refuse the Lord who came and paid a debt He did not owe for the debt that I could not pay? I needed somebody to take care of this sin and take it away. Aren't you glad you know the Savior? Mm. I was seven, probably 16 years old when I first heard that song, Oh, What a Savior. Old Commander's Quartet used to come to, the court, uh, come to Concord. And after I heard that song the first time, here I am, a little teenager, saying, Would you sing that, Oh, What a Savior? And I'd set my reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder up, and I'd just put those speakers, and I'd go home, and I'd listen to it time and time and time again.
Because it sang about somebody that loved me when I was not lovable. It sang about somebody that I loved. Jesus, I, I know this is these are earthly terms, but He is my hero. I mean, there's nobody like Jesus in my eyes. I love His name. I love to speak His name. I'm not ashamed to say Jesus anywhere because He is. He's my Lord. He is my Savior. Is He yours? Do you act like it? Hey, act like Joshua. Fear not. I've given you the victory. Walk on in faith and know that there's peace that I give you. Walk on in faith and know my promises are sure. Walk on in faith and know that my power is for you. And if I'm for you, can't nobody come against you and succeed. Hallelujah. Father, thank you that you have given us such a gift as the Lord, Jesus. And Father, I am so thankful that the battle